display filters are used to focus in on specific traffic in a trace file or even live while you're capturing. We typically type in a display filter up here in the display filter window area, but there are a number of different ways of getting the filter information up in that window. In this module, we're going to focus on following a TCP stream. And I'll show you how to pull out a single TCP stream out of a trace, and I'll even show you how to reassemble the data that was transferred across that TCP stream. The first trace file I'm going to open has multiple uh, TCP streams in it. It's called evilprogram.dmp. And this is a workstation that boots up and keeps getting reinfected. It's got some sort of a malware program on it, and it goes and it reinfects itself. As I scroll through this trace, you can see a number of handshake packets up there, all these SYN packets and resets, and SYN and reset. But we get to a point a little further on in the trace where now we have a web browsing session taking place, a very short web browsing session. If we look at the DNS information that leads that, we can see that the client system is going and making a DNS query for updatekeepalive.mcafee.com and they get back an IP address. Now the next communications that happen, the client is using port 1028 going to the HTTP port, port 80. If I scroll down just a little bit further, you can see that they've also made a connection on port 1030, port 1031, and then they make a request for a query for us.mcafee.com. They get the same IP address back, but now they make a connection and it actually seems like they do something over this connection. We can filter out that one TCP stream to see what happens during the McAfee update process. Just by clicking any one of those packets in that TCP stream, then right mouse clicking and choosing to follow the stream. By default, Wireshark is going to put the client communications in red and the server communications in blue. So we can see everything that happened over that TCP connection between those two hosts. It's really one of the most useful filters that you will use in Wireshark. I'm going to move this window down a little bit so you can see that a really nice display filter has been placed up in the display filter window. And by default, it's also been applied to the traffic in the background. So that's all we're seeing. You can tell when a display filter has been applied to traffic because if you look down at the bottom at the status bar, you'll see the letter P for the number of packets that are in the trace, the letter D that tells you how many packets are being displayed at this time, and would indicate any marked packets as well. So here we've got that one stream. And we have a number of things that we can do now that we've pulled that stream out and we're looking at it in ASCII format. You can see there are various different formats that you can look at the stream in. There's EBCDIC, a hex dump, which gives us the hex offsets on the left-hand side, the hex value, and then the ASCII interpretation on the right. In C arrays. And then finally, we can see it in raw format. Now in raw format, we can see that in raw format, we still see the ASCII text nice and clearly. We can also, on the left-hand side, choose to save the entire contents of this stream. So we can say we want to save it as and give it a name. Saved McAfee process. Now this stream will be saved just in the format that I have in the background there. So I may want to save it as a text file so I can open it up just with a text editor and see what was transferred across that stream. If you wish you can print it and you can define what printer you want to go to and how many pages of it you want to print and how many copies, or you can print it to a file as well. And we can also say that we're interested in either the entire conversation, it tells us how many bytes are in the entire conversation, or we're interested in traffic flowing in one direction only. So we can pull out, and there's all the client traffic, or we can pull out all the server traffic, see what the server sent back to the client. Now, by default, this stream has been filtered in the background in the trace file. That means that that's the only stream that we're watching. That's the only traffic we're watching in that trace file now. If we know that this is McAfee traffic, let's say, and we know that it's good traffic, we might want to get it out of our view in the background. So we're not focusing on what we know is good traffic. In that case, we can click the filter out this stream button on the bottom right-hand corner. 
now instead of filtering in that stream, it's filtered it out. And it's done that by putting in the exclamation point in front of the filter. Exclamation point means not. So now we're seeing all traffic except traffic to and from those two hosts. And it's not just a filter on host information, host address, but it's also based on port number. So the previous connection that the client made to the McAfee server using ports 1030, 1031, 1029, etc., will still be in the trace. We can scroll down and we can see that those other communications are still in there. If we wanted to get rid of those communications as well, we might want to build a filter saying that we don't want any traffic going to the IP address of the McAfee server. Now, I'd like to show you how you can use this TCP stream filtering process to reassemble data that's crossed the cabling system. The first thing I'm going to do is clear out that filter, because if I open up another trace file and that filter is still in place, none of the traffic may match that, so I, I may end up without seeing any valid traffic from my trace, even though I know the traffic is there. So I'm going to open up a trace file now, which is called FTP Download Good. And here I've got a portion of an FTP communication. I can see that I've got the data channel there, so here we see the traffic with a request type I for a binary download. There's passive request, entering passive mode. And then we see another connection being established. And that secondary connection is the one that the data will be transferred across. Now in here we can see in the command channel the request goes across the wire saying, I'd like the size of the fun with bill directory file Microsoft-1978.jpg. Well, the great thing about being able to see the actual file name just before the download starts is that when we reassemble the file, we don't have to try to figure out what, tri what type of file it is. We already know what the original file name is and what the extension is. That's not always the case. Sometimes you'll have to figure that out by looking at the contents of the file later. So I'm going to scroll down a bit to where we see the file transfer taking place. Here we go, there's the FTP data transfer taking place. I'm going to right mouse click and say that I want to follow that stream. Now here's the file that's been transferred. And we can see we can't really read much about that file. There doesn't seem to be a lot of ASCII text in the file as far as we can tell so far. You should know that up at the front of the file there is a file signature area there that will help us identify the contents of a file. We can see JFIF right there is an indication that this is a JPEG file. Just so you know, when you look at it in hex dump format, there's also this identifier of FFD8, FFE0, which is an indication of a JPEG file. I'm going to now look at this file in raw format. And this is important. If you're going to try to reassemble a file, after you've seen the stream or you've picked up the trace and it has that stream in it and you've pulled it out, if you want to reassemble the file and see it just as the user saw it on their system, you've got to make sure that you select RAW. Even though RAW and ASCII look the same, they're not. You'll find that there's some interpretations that it might corrupt the file to save it in ASCII format. So I'm going to select RAW and I'm going to save this file as, and I'm going to call this ms 1978 I know the extension, oops, 1978, and I know the extension because I saw it in the data channel just before the file download occurred. I'll save this file. Now I'm going to toggle over to my folder and I'm going to open up that file. Here's the folder. There's the, there's the saved McAfee process text file that I opened up earlier. And here is this ms-1978.jpg file. And of course we have the, the icon in the front indicating it's a picture because I put the JPEG extension at the end. Now I'm going to right mouse click and I think I'm going to open this up with paint. And sure enough there is the graphic file that was downloaded, which is kind of a humorous graphic file. If you'd like to try this on your own, I have a number of file transfers in a trace file that's called FTP dash download good and here you go. This is the trace file. You'll see that I have the uh, command sequence that occurs 
right before the download begins. And there are several different downloads in there. Make sure that when you go through and you want to do your reassembly, you want to try this out, make sure that you go through and look ahead of the file download to find out what the extension is so you know how to open that file once you get it on your local system. As I said before, this is one of the most useful filters that you will use in Wireshark, and it's so easy to do. Another thing to keep in mind is that if you spend a lot of your time looking in this bottom right-hand area here where you've got the uh, ASCII text version of what's being transferred, if you see a lot of that, and it's a TCP IP communication, stop. Make sure that you right mouse click and say that you want to follow a stream. And it will show you exactly what transferred back and forth between the client and the server. And you don't have to go scrolling through the trace file to do that. It's a lot faster way to work. Now you can also build filters using the conversations and endpoints information. I'm going to open up a trace file called evilprogram.dmp and that has a lot of different conversations in it. A number of the conversations were unsuccessful so we see some sins and some resets. But a number of the conversations were successful. I'm going to select statistics, conversations. Now we can filter based on the MAC address if we wish. We can say that we want to capture all traffic between this Intel card and a broadcast address. And to do that I would just select that one conversation, right mouse click. Now here we have a choice. We can either apply this as a filter or we can prepare it. And preparing it allows us to add to the filter. I'll show you what I mean. In applying this filter, I could say I want to apply the filter based on the selected value, A to B. Once I click on that, the filter is going to be applied to the background, and that's the traffic that I'll be looking at. But what if I wanted to add another conversation to that filter? Say I'm looking at the Intel traffic to broadcast, or I'm interested in this other traffic. In that case, I would select the first conversation I'm interested in, right mouse click, and say that I want to prepare a filter based on the selected value. You have all of these directional options here, and I'm interested, in, let's say, bidirectional between address A and address B, so I'll select that. We can see that it's prepared the filter, but the filter hasn't been applied yet in the background. Now, because I did prepare filter, I can add to that. So this is another traffic pattern I want to capture, let's say, or filter on. I'll right mouse click, prepare a filter, and now I'm going to add to it. And this is when we use these areas that start with dot, dot, dot. Now, if you say and selected, that's not going to match anything. There won't be any conversations that have both the source and destination MAC addresses listed in the two filters. We only have two areas where we have source and destination MAC address, and we can't have that combination of variety in there. That's just not going to work. So we would say or selected. We want to get that traffic up there or the selected traffic down below. So I'll say prepare filter or selected and I'll choose bidirectional. Now it's placed the filter up above based on the Ethernet address. I'm looking for traffic that has an Ethernet address of this first address and an Ethernet address of broadcast or I'm looking for any traffic that has this second set of addresses in it. When I'm ready to apply it I'll click apply and now I have just those two traffic types. It may look a little strange here because it feels like I should only see two conversations, but I am only seeing two conversations, but it's based on MAC address, not IP address. So I'll clear that filter out now, and I'll toggle back over to the conversations window, window which is still open in the background. Now I want to go over to the TCP IP area here. And the TCP IP tab tells me that there are 90 TCP conversations that it's seen. I'm going to sort based on the byte column and see which communications had the most data crossing them. So here I can see some HTTP communications. Then I have one here that is a strange one. 
K-pop. Now I know that this client doesn't use K-pop, the application K-pop, but what's happening is that Wireshark is putting in a name, a representative name for a port number because I have transport name resolution turned on in the preferences area. And we can see this is now this is my client right here. And my client seems to have port 1025 talking to this K-pop port, which doesn't seem normal to me. So I'm going to select that conversation. I'm going to right mouse click and say that I want to apply this as a filter based on the selected value going both directions. Now I've pulled out that one communication and here I can see it's some sort of a DCE RPC communication actually that's taking place over that uh, port number. Remember, if you spend a lot of time scrolling through packets, looking in the bottom right-hand corner to try to see what data was exchanged over a particular TCP uh, session, don't forget that you can right mouse click and follow the stream and have it rebuild that data communication for you. So that is the stream that's crossing the cabling system. Interestingly enough, at the bottom of the stream, we actually see the name of a Word document in Unicode format. Unicode format is where we take two bytes to represent a number character or symbol instead of one. So it shows up with this dot and then character number symbol, dot, character number and symbol. It looks a little strange, but it's in Unicode format. I'm going to close this window. Now just by going in and looking at the TCP stream like that, I've applied a new filter, but it's the same filter that matches what I just did using conversations under the statistics area. I'm going to clear out that filter now, go back to statistics, conversations, and I'm interested in the TCP communication still. And this time I'm going to sort on bytes again and look at all of these communications that are going to this port 1025. It just doesn't have a very good feel to it. Scroll down a little further, see if there's anything interesting in there. Any one of these conversations are ones that you could just right mouse click and say that you want to apply a filter on or prepare a filter and pull out a number of these conversations. Now I'll check on UDP, see what's going on over there. I'm going to sort based on the bytes column because the interesting stuff really happens with a fair amount of bytes. Usually, you know, it's not just one or two bytes. Now again, it's not that my client is sending packets from the Doom port because they're playing Doom. It just I've got my transport name resolution turned on and so it's changing the port number to say that it's Doom Communications. Now this is kind of interesting but I'm going to go to another trace file that has an IRC channel in it and we'll see what it looks like when you pull out the IRC channel. Before I do that I just want to mention that there's no print function in here, there's no extract function in here or export function. At some point there may be in Wireshark but right now there isn't in this version I'm working with. If I wanted to save this information, I could say copy, and now it's pasted it to the clipboard. I've just toggled over to WordPad, and I'm going to paste that information in. And here we can see, there it is in comma-separated format. So this is nice because I can pop it right into a spreadsheet and use that spreadsheet to do additional st statistical analysis on the information. At this point, I'm going to open up a trace file called Client Dying. Here we go. This is a system that boots up and lasts about three minutes, and then CPU utilization goes to 100%, and then it dies. I'll select Statistics, Commons. I've only got one conversation happening at the Mac layer, but I've got 13 different IP conversations going on and my client is 172.16.1.10. We can sort again based on the bytes column and see who it's talking to the most based on a byte count. Go over TCP, click on the bytes column again twice, sort it up to the top. Now this is one of the IRC channels right here. This is an IRC channel port. If I scroll down, I can see that they're doing HTTP communications. Oh, look at that. It appears that FTP communication. Now, my client does not support the FTP port, so most likely that's somebody coming in and trying to make a handshake to my client on the FTP port, and my client turned around and said, sorry, reset. 
that would account for the two packets instead of three packets as required by a normal handshake. I'll come back up to the top and I pull out this top conversation and apply a filter based on that conversation going both directions. And there we go. There is the TCP handshake establishing the IRC connection. There's the IRC request going across the wire. Now remember, Wireshark is smart. It doesn't always just assume that because you're using port 6666 or 6667 that you're doing some sort of an IRC communication. And with a number of these communications, it will actually look at the commands and try to figure out what application is actually using that port number. Now this is interesting because we can see in the bottom right hand corner we've got the password for the IRC channel showing up. And as we scroll through we can see a nickname go across the wire, information about the Hunted Devils network, looking up your host name etc. Remember if you spend a lot of time in that bottom right hand corner don't forget that's the hint that you need to right mouse click and follow with the stream so you can just read what's happening in clear text. It's easy to do. I'm going to clear out this filter. Just as we use statistics to pull out a, or conversations to pull out a specific set of packets out of the trace we can also use endpoints. Now remember, the difference between endpoints and conversations is that conversations are pairs of devices communicating, whereas in endpoints we're looking specifically at one host or one device. We don't care who they're communicating with, we're just gathering the statistics based on that one endpoint. I'll click over on TCP and I want to see who's communicating most in this trace. Here we can see most of the traffic appears to be flowing, the bytes appear to be associated with this IP address here. We can see that most of those bytes are transmitted by that host. So I'm going to select that communication, right mouse click and apply a filter based on the selected value. Now it's a very simple filter that's been built for me. It's not a conversation filter which is big and long and has IP addresses and port numbers for both sides of a communication. Now I'm just looking for 216.127.33.119 using port 80. Now the IP address, it doesn't matter whether it's a source or destination there, it just puts an IP address. At TCP port, it doesn't care whether it's source or destination, it's just picking up the TCP port. And here we can see there's an HTTP communication from my client to the server making a handshake and then going through and making a request to get a file. And there's the file download process taking place. So you don't always have to just type in filter information. Another good way of doing it is just using your conversations and endpoints. One other thing you can do with Wireshark is in the statistics area you can go up under conversation list and pull out specific conversations that are listed here. You'll see there's our Ethernet, there's our IP version 4, there's our TCP, there's our UDP, or you can go into the endpoint list, there's our Ethernet, IP version 4, TCP or UDP there. Once you bring up any one of those, you're really focusing on just that one specific area. Again, you can select some conversation, here's a TFTP communication, you can right mouse click and say that you want to apply that as a filter based on the selected value. You don't have the option of choosing the direction of traffic though when you select to go that simplified way. Wireshark comes with a default list of display filters. In this module I'm going to show you what those display filters are and I'm also going to show you where you can get assistance with display filter syntax. To get to the display filter list, you can select Analyze Display Filters, or you can click on the little icon on your toolbar that shows the little funnel going down into a box, or you can just click the filter button to the left of the display filter window. Now I've got the default display filter list here that came with this version of Wireshark and I've added a couple of display filters down at the bottom. The nice thing about the default display filter list is that they're the ones that you'll use probably most often and they give you an idea of how to do more complex filters. So here's a filter for an Ethernet address. 
you may want to leave the display filters the default set of display filters as they are and if you're going to create a new version of a filter let's say you want to have your Ethernet address in there you may want to click new and then your new filter will be placed at the bottom of the list using the same name at this point I'll put in my Mac and here I'll put in my MAC address. So I'll wipe out that previous address and type in my own. Now it's also telling you, besides telling you the format, it's telling you the syntax of the string at the beginning, the operand in the middle, and then also it's showing you the syntax of the data on the right hand side. You'll see that MAC addresses have to go in with colons between each byte. You cannot put in dashes between the bytes. You get an error message from Wireshark. Now unlike capture filters, display filters have an error checking mechanism so that if you had a typo here, it would show up with a red background. That's really nice. The good and the bad of that is that it's nice to have an error checking mechanism. It's too bad that we need it and that display filters can get so complex. I like that display filter that I built. It's called My Mac. Scroll back up. Now I'll look at some of the other display filters that are set up in here. There's a filter looking for ARP, and it's based on the ether type field. So here we can see that the filter string is eth.type, equal sign, equal sign. And again, in a moment, I'll show you where you can get a listing of all these different filter strings. An Ethernet broadcast, eth.addr, equal sign, equal sign, and then fffffffffff. Now just a note here, when you're putting anything on the right-hand side, it, the hex value there, I could put in uppercase hef, hex. It doesn't matter, but you can never put in uppercase on the left-hand side. All of the strings have to be in lowercase always, so you'll see if I change the lowercase e to an uppercase e, it's not going to work. So make sure that always your strings on the left-hand side of the operand there, your strings are always going to be in lowercase. No ARP. We have a NOT operand, and there's two ways, there are two ways that we can do that. We can do that with the word NOT, and we can do it with an exclamation point. They both, both do exactly the same thing. Look how simple some of these filters are. IP only. All we have to do, the, the filter string is just IP. And that's it. And once you know that, then you get a general idea that if you wanted to build a filter for NCP traffic, the filter string is just NCP. The filter string for IPX, IPX, TCP is just TCP. UDP is just UDP. HTTP is just HTTP. The one that does seem to get people confused, though, is boot P. Now, I just clicked on new, and so down at the bottom of my filter, I have a new version of the HTTP filter that I was looking at there, and I'm going to change that. Now, what I'm doing is I'm looking for DHCP traffic, and the natural thing that people do is they type in DHCP, and you'll see that it shows up in all red, but that's not what the filter string is. The filter string is boot P, because DHCP is derived from boot P. So now I've just added a nice filter in there for boot P traffic and it will also cover all my DHCP traffic automatically. Now I'll go back up here and show you some of the more complex filters. Um, well here's, here's a standard one you'll use all the time which is IP.ADDR equal sign equal sign. That's one you, you're not going to go into the filters area I'm sure for this. You're just going to type that in up at the filters uh, window I'm sure. Here's one where we're using a negative and we're saying IP address isn't 192.168.0.1. Don't use isn't equal to for this. And let me show you what they're saying. If you build a filter like this, where you say is not equal to, there are two ways of doing not. One is you can put it right before the operand, and the other one is that you can put it right before the entire filter string. Now, if you build your filter like this, saying you don't want to see this IP traffic, unfortunately, you're probably going to catch that IP traffic because the IP.addr field uh, name there is looking at either the source field or the destination. So in here, with this filter, you're saying one of the IP address fields should not be equal to 192.168.0.1. Either one of them should not be, but the other one might be. 
when you put the exclamation point right before, you're saying neither of the IP address fields should contain 192.168.0.1. That's why this one has a note on it, because that's a common mistake that people make when they're doing IP address filters and they're using the not operand. Again, here's another note. UDP port is not 53. In other words, it's not DNS traffic. We put the exclamation point at the very front of that filter. We don't use the exclamation point equal sign for the operand there. This one says it's either TCP or UDP using port 80. Now you see the OR operand showing up. The OR operand is that pipe pipe. And we could have parentheses in there or we could choose not to have parentheses in there. But as long as you have matching open parens and end parens, the syntax should be fine. Here you can see an HTTP filter. This one says, I'm not, I don't want to see ARP and I don't want to see DNS either. So it's done with two different methods. One is using the word not and the other is using the exclamation point. And we are saying not ARP and not UDP. Uh, port 53, DNS traffic. A lot of people put in the OR operand, and that doesn't work if you use the OR operand. I mean, logically we think it shouldn't be this or it shouldn't be this, but actually we're anding. We're saying match it to the first not situation, oops, the first not situation right there, which is not ARP. That's our, that's our first filter, and then match it to the next one to make sure it doesn't match that either or that it does match that, I should say, as well. Here's one where it says non-HTTP and non-SMTP traffic to and from 192.168.0.1. So we're putting the not operand in there, saying not, and we say which port we don't care about, we don't want, and not, and this time we do an and, but we didn't include the not operand in front of it. So we are interested in this particular traffic. Remember that when AND is in there, you treat it as three separate filters and just say, does it match this filter? Yes, it matches that filter. Does it match this filter? Oh, I'm sorry, it's SMTP traffic and we don't want to have that, so it's going to be dumped. And then finally it will go for the first filter. So we treat them as separate filters when we have the AND operand in there. Now I've added a filter for HTTP response codes. The syntax is http.response.code, and I know that code 200 is an OK. I've also added a filter for HTTP 404 file not found packets. So again, I've used the syntax of http.response.code, equal sign, equal sign, 404. And let me show you where you can see the master list of all of these different uh, display syntax names. I'm on the Wireshark homepage, and I'll select Documentation. I'll scroll down, and here we can see the Display Filter Reference Area. I'll click on that, and as you scroll down, you will see there's the index line. If you're interested in building filters for, let's say, HTTP traffic, you could click on the letter H, and here are all the protocols that Wireshark has decodes for that start with the letter H. And there's HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. I'll click on that. Now it takes me to the listing of the field names. So HTTP date, HTTP host, location, notify, connection. I'll scroll down even further. There's our response code right there. HTTP server set cookie. You have all of these different areas. and all of the protocols are broken up this way. We can go to, let's say we want to go to see what we can do with IP. What kind of filters can we build based on IP? So we'll go into this area and I'll select Internet Protocol and now we're looking at the Internet Protocol area. So these are all of the IP filters that you can build using display filters. These are all the field names. So there's the one you'll use most often probably, IP.ADDR and ip.dst and ip flags maybe.
The default set of display filters is kept in the program files Wireshark directory, and it's just basically a text file. You can right mouse click and say that you want to open the file, and I'm going to open this file with Notepad so it'll be nice and clean. Or no, let's open it up with WordPad. There we go. And you can see, there's the default list. Now you'll see that the filters that I added are not in here because those are saved in a different directory. Now I'll close this window down. Now before I take you over to that folder, I've got to go back and save those filters that I created because until I save those filters, they won't be added to my filter list in my personal directory. So I'm back over in Wireshark now and the filters that I added were the my Mac filter and the DHCP filter. Now, at this ver in this version of Wireshark, finally, it's an implied save when you say OK. So I'll click on OK. Now I can go show you the filter file. Your personal filters are saved in the drive where you've installed Wireshark, your documents and settings, WSU developer, application data, and then Wireshark. There we can see the D filters file. I'll open it up, make sure that I have the My Mac filter and the DHCP filter, and there they are down at the bottom there. One thing you may want to do is try to avoid editing the, dis the default display filter set because you always want to be able to get back to that if you totally screw up the filters, you always want to be able to come back to this defilters file here and use that as your, dis your default set. You can go ahead and rename your set, but keep your dis default display filter set pristine at all times. Sometimes you'll want to build filters just based on something that you see in a packet as you're, as you're looking at the packet contents. And there's an easy way to do that. Let's say I scroll down to a packet in here. All right, here it's a TFTP packet. Now we know that I can just type in TFTP and just create a filter based on this TFTP traffic. But maybe I'm interested in one, sp one specific field inside of this packet. I'll scroll through here, and I'm interested in, there we can see the TFTP stuff, there's the TFTP opcode saying that it's a data packet. I want to filter on all TFTP opcodes indicating that they are data packets. So I can right mouse click, now we have a choice, we can either immediately apply this as a filter, or we could prepare a filter based on that and add to it. And as you're learning, probably the best thing to do is to prepare a filter so it goes up in that window and you start learning what the syntax is for those filter names. So we can see this filter would be tftp.opcode equal sign equal sign 3. In addition, this gives you a chance to edit it later on. So if you want to change it to a different opcode, you can do that. I'll apply this filter to the traffic. And now I've pulled out just the TFTP traffic that has an opcode of 3, indicating that it's a data packet. I'll clear this filter out because I'd like to show you some additional places that you can build filters that are pretty interesting. In the front of every packet you have this frame section here. Now most of the time I leave the frame section collapsed because I don't really pay a lot of attention to the frame up at the top itself, the frame information at the top itself. But there are a couple of interesting areas such as this delta time since previous packet. We can right mouse click on that line and say prepare a filter based on the selected value. And look what we've got now. We now have a frame filter up there based on time. So right now it says the frame time delta should be equal to this value. Now I can say that I'm interested in any frame time deltas that are greater than 0 0.1, let's say. Hit enter to apply that and all of the packets in here should have a delta time greater than 0.1. I'll check that out and make sure it worked by selecting View, Time Display Format, and the seconds since the previous packet. 
So now my time column is giving me only packets, only the information on packets based on the delta time. So from the end of one packet to the end of the next. And it looks like all of my packets here match that. Just to check it a little further, I only want packets that have a delta time greater than one. And there we go. Now we filtered out even farther. Wow, there are some really ugly spots in that trace. How about a delta time greater than two? There we go. This is one of the best filters that you'll make when you work with Wireshark. Now, just as we use that filter, I'll, I'll clear this one out. What if we were looking at, let's say, statistics, the I.O. graph? And we looked at the statistics and we said, you know what, we, I want to know what happened about 90 seconds into the trace. So I'll close out the I.O. graph. Now again, I'm going to use some of the information up in the frame section. Just as we selected the time delta from previous packet, there's also a line that says the time reference, since the time reference, or the first frame. Now our time reference is set as the time from the end of one packet to the next. So I'm going to change that to the seconds since the beginning of the capture. And instead of scrolling through here to get to about 90 seconds into the trace, I'm going to use this line in the frame area as my seed for building a filter. I'll right mouse click, say that I want to prepare a filter based on the selected value. Frame time relative. Okay, well, I'm going to do a right arrow and put in 90 seconds and hit enter. And now I'm 90 seconds into the trace. Easy way of getting to a specific time inside of a trace file. Now I'm going to show you how you can save these filters so that you don't have to remember the frame time relative stuff. You don't have to look inside the packet, open up the frame area and do that. Once you have a filter up here that you like, you can click the filter button on the left hand side and the filter window will appear. Now by default it puts in the name of your filter as new filter. Up here in the list, though, we don't see it. Normally, filters will be added to the bottom of this list. It won't be added to the bottom of this list until you click New. So make sure you click New before you click OK to exit out of here. This may be changed in a future version of Wireshark so that it's automatically listed up above. I'm going to give it the name of uh, Frame Time Into Trace. Now, yes, I have the number 90 in there, but at least if I need to use that at a later time, I can just pull it up and change it however I want to. So I'll say new. Now that filter is added to the bottom of my display filter list. Say OK. Now if I clear out that filter, someday I want to go 90, or let's say 42 seconds into the trace, I can click on my filter list, select my frame time into trace, say OK, and I can go through and just change it to 42 and apply that. I'll scroll back up to the top to see the first packet in there. It looks like the frame time relative the first time that I had is 56 seconds. Could that be what happened to my 55 seconds, my 54 seconds? I'll clear this out and see that Nothing happened between 38 seconds in the trace and 56 seconds in the trace. So that filter did work prof properly. Another thing you should know is that Wireshark will keep the last 10 filters that you used. So if I, if I want to apply that filter again, I'll just select frame time re reference 42 and apply it again. Now I'd like to show you an example of where you can build a filter based on some commands and it can be really useful. The trace I'm going to open up is called FTP get file. Now you'll notice that when I open it up I don't see any packets at all because I still left that display filter up from the last trace I was looking at. This is really a common mistake. People open up a trace file and there's just nothing there and they feel like the trace file is empty and they just don't happen to see that they have a display file, uh, display filter already set up. So I'll clear the display filter and there, there's my traffic. Now this is an FTP communication, and in here I'm highlighting packet number 8, which is the user command going across the wire with the user's name of Fred. Now inside the packet contents in this middle window, 
I'm going to open up the FTP area and I'm going to expand it all the way. Now I can either click it individually there or I can right mouse click and I say I want to expand the subtree. And we can see that the user command is separated from Fred. So I can right mouse click on the user command and say I want to prepare it as a filter based on the selected value. And there's a really nice filter. Not only that, but if I know some of the other FTP commands, I can replace this data with the other FTP commands. So I know RETR is the command to retrieve a file. I'll hit enter, and there in the whole filter is my retrieve command. I know that CWD is the command to change working directory, and I'll hit enter, and I can see there are two CWD commands in that trace. Later in this section, we're going to go through Boolean operands and how we can string together a series of these commands so we can get anybody changing the working directory or the user command or the pass command in an FTP communication. You can also quickly and easily build filters all the way down to the binary level. So I've opened up the TCP header here, and I'm interested in the flags. And I want to know how many of the packets in this entire trace have the push flag set to 1. Now, I could highlight the whole entire flags line and build a filter based on that, but it's looking for a flag setting of having both the push flag set and the ACK bit set. That's how we get the hex value 1.8. If I'm just interested in packets with the push flag set, I can right mouse click on that one individual flag and prepare a filter based on that flag. And we can see the syntax there, tcp.flags.push equals sign equals sign 1 and I'll apply that filter and we can see that the, a lot of the traffic in here has the push flag set to 1. That means you're not supposed to buffer it on the way out and you're not supposed to buffer it on the receiving end. I'd like to show you another filter that you can build using existing packet contents. Just as before we were looking at the frame header contents, we were way up at the top of the packet and I opened up the frame area and we were looking at this delta time since the previous packet. There are a number of other areas in that frame section there that you might want to build a filter on. For example, maybe the capture length or the packet length where we can right mouse click and say that we want to prepare a filter based on the selected value and there's the syntax. So we're looking for all frames that were captured that were 64 bytes in length. Or maybe I want to filter based on all the marked packets in a trace file. In this case, I'll select frame is marked false right mouse click, prepare the filter, select it, but now this time I want to change it because I'm looking for packets that are marked. So I'll change the value from 0, which is off, to 1, which is on. In addition, you have the protocol list. The, these are the protocols that are found in the frame. And if I only want to pull out packets that have an Ethernet header, with an IP header, with a TCP header, I can right mouse click and say that I want to prepare a filter based on the selected. There we go, that is the syntax. In addition, you can even filter based on a coloring rule. So I've got a coloring rule for TCP traffic. You can right mouse click and prepare a filter based on a coloring rule. Frame.coloring underscore rule dot name equal sign equal sign TCP. Besides the frame area, which has these special fields in it, you might also find that the TCP header has special fields in it. For example, here I have a TCP header, and you'll see the sequence and acknowledgement analysis area here. I'll open that up. Now, th these are not fields in the frame. This is information that Wireshark has analyzed and displayed based on that frame. So here we see one that says the round trip to ACK the segment was, and it tells you what the time is. We can right mouse click on that and say that we want to prepare a filter based on that selected value. And here we can see the tcp.analysis.ac underscore round trip time equals a certain amount. If we want to, we can find the big delays in a trace by saying well, we're looking for anything greater than, let's say, 0 0.05. And there we go. Only the packets that have data sent out and the acknowledgement came back greater than 0 0.05 seconds later will be shown in our trace file. This one is one of those filters that I absolutely love. So I w would highly recommend that if you build one of these filters, you save it to your filter list 
because it's going to be one that you'll use over and over again. This is my AC round trip time greater than filter. I'll click on new to make sure that it shows up in the listing up above and now I can click OK and that's been saved. Spending the time to learn how to build really strong display filters is never a waste of time. Make sure that as you go through and you just you build those display filters that you always save the ones that you really like. You can always edit the data value and edit the operand later. But it's nice to just have the syntax. Building a filter that looks for specific data down in the payload can be a little bit tricky. Sometimes you're better off just using the find command. I'll start by using a file called FTP get file as an example. Now, if I use the find command and I say I'm looking for the value SYS, I can say I'm looking for that value in uppercase or lowercase by not selecting case sensitive and I'm looking for a string value. Say I want to find that packet, and there we go, I found the packet, it's packet number 21. I'll hit Control N to see if there's another instance, and it finds it again in packet number 24. Control N says packet number 42 has that, and Control N says packet number 63 has that, and that's the end. So it looks like there are four packets that match. Now the problem with doing a data filter is that Wireshark sees what we would consider a data a lot of times as something that's linked to a protocol. For example, if we're looking for the data in an FTP or an HTTP communication that says cookie, if there's a cookie somewhere in there in the communications, actually Wireshark sees that as the HTTP.cookie field name. You can't just search for data containing the word cookie, even though we may think it's data because the HTTP session has been established and it's not a command. So here's how you can tell what Wireshark considers a data packet or a packet containing data. I'll just type in data and hit enter. Now all of these packets right here contain what Wireshark considers as data. It's information that's not being associated with a specific protocol. It's considered just plain old payload that Wireshark can't decode any further. Now I'll clear out this filter and I'll create a data contains filter. So I'll say data contains and I'm looking for the value SYS and it's got to be correct as far as uppercase lowercase when we build our filter. I'll apply this to the trace and only two packets came out as containing SYS in them. We can look inside of those packets. Let me bring this up just a little bit. There we go. And there this one has got SYS down here where it says system and let me look at the other one. Okay, that's pretty obvious right there, SYS. But when we were doing the find command, we found four packets that matched the SYS data content, didn't we? So let's see what happened. I'll clear out this filter, go to the top of the trace file. Now I'm going to do a control F just to show you there's my uh, find screen. I'll select find. Now there's packet 21 and that's what our, that's what our filter caught. I'll do a control N to see the next instance and that's another packet that our filter caught. I'll hit control N again but now this is a packet that our filter did not catch but we can see that it has SYS in it right here. Why didn't it catch that? Well because it's not part of the data. If we look in the middle window right there and we click on the data field we can see that there are three bytes of data. What follows the data is padding and because of that Wireshark said hey wait a minute this is not data that contains SYS. We didn't tell it to look through the padding to look for SYS. So that's why it can be a little bit tricky. Let me show you another instance where it might be kind of weird. I'll open up an HTTP communication. This is one where I was going out to ESPN.com. Now just as I said before, Wireshark doesn't consider everything that's everything is data that we would consider as data. It might consider it somehow linked to a protocol. So the first thing I'll do is I'll just even check to see whether a data contains uh, filter would work and I'll hit enter. Okay, it does look like we have some packets where data contains would work. Go ahead and bring this window down. 
I'll go ahead and bring this window down, and yes, it needs to refresh itself. There we go. So I'm looking for, in this HTTP traffic, I am looking for any packet that might have the word cookie in it. Because we know when we do these HTTP communications, a lot of times we'll see the word cookie that's being sent up from our client or that's being sent down from the other side, the other the server that we're communicating with. So we want to know if the word cookie appears anywhere in that payload. So up in the filter area, I'll type data contains. Now, I know that cookie is usually capitalized at the beginning, so I'll put a capital C at the beginning, hit enter, and no packets match our filter. I'm pretty sure, though, in that HTTP communication, there's a cookie going back and forth one way or the other. So I'll select clear. Now I'm going to use my find command and just see if I can find it that way. There we go. Packet number 21 here has the word cookie inside of it. So as I scroll down, there it is, cookie, right there. But Wireshark didn't get it because if we look at that packet, we see TCP, the TCP header, segment data, and although it sits in the data portion down here, there's our word cookie, Wireshark has a syntax name specifically for HTTP cookies. HTTP cookie, and that's it. And hit enter, and now it will find all of the packets that have an HTTP cookie in it. So you have to be careful that when you're looking for something, it's not already a syntax or a name value that Wireshark recognizes. Let me take you to another example. First, I'll clear out this filter. I'll open up a file, and this file I'm going to open up is called Client Dying. Now, I know there's an IRC channel in here, and I'm going to type IRC just to pull out that IRC channel. When I look down in this portion of the packet, I can see that in packet number, there we go, packet number 140, we have the word host name in there. Now, I would like to know if I can use any sort of a data command or a data syntax to find that. So can I do data contains and then put in host name? I can tell you right now, the first thing we have to do is type data and hit enter. And we can see right then and there, our data filter syntax is not going to work. And you saw as I was typing it in, it was red. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's nothing that Wireshark considers as data in that whole entire trace file. And because of that, that must mean that there's some sort of a field that we have to use or a value that we have to use in the filter area instead of data. And sure enough, it's irc.response contains, and then we put in name or host name. Hit enter, and there we go. It can be so tricky to build some of these data filters. And that's why using the find command is great. I'd like to give you one more example of trying to find a certain value somewhere in a packet. I'm going to open up a trace file called io-ftp upload. Now this is an FTP communication where somebody's copying a PDF file up to a server. Now I would like to find the signature of the PDF file crossing the wire. Now, as I mentioned in previous sections, all file types have some sort of a signature. Usually right at the beginning of the file, you'll find a signature that identifies what type of a file it is. If it's an executable, it will be a capital M, capital Z, capital M as in Mary, capital Z as in Zebra. Well, let's take a look at what the signature is for a PDF file. I'm in just a test directory where I have a PDF file called sharks.pdf. I'm going to, on my system, right mouse click, and I'm going to open it up with a tool called File Elizer. Now basically all I'm going to do is look at a hex dump of that file. So you can use any tool out there that you use to, to view hex dumps. Here we go. Here's the file in hex format right here. There's the position, the offset, and there is the ASCII value. Now when we build this next filter, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to just type in a text value. And I can see there's a file signature right there, percent sign 
capital P, capital D, capital F. That indicates it's a PDF file. But Wireshark isn't going to recognize ASCII text. It will recognize hex. So we're going to have to type in 25504446 as the value we're searching for in that trace file. Now the first thing we can do is we can type in data, see if any packets come up matching just generic data. And there we go. Now what if we did a data contains and we hit enter. Let's see what it comes up with. There we go. It found the very first packet there that has the percent sign PDF and that is great. But that's not always going to work because if it doesn't see it as data, it won't allow you to use the data contains. So if you try to use data contains and it doesn't work, let me tell you another way that you can find that information. So I'll clear this filter out completely. We can explicitly tell Wireshark where to look in the packet. And we can do this by using the frame filter syntax. And immediately after frame, we put in an open bracket and we tell it how far into the packet we want it to search. Where should data sit? Now when you look at a TCP packet that has data in it, let's open up this packet right here. There we go. I'm gonna, there's, my, there's my TCP header. There's my data portion. Now this is giving me the offset in a hex value, but here's the offset I'm interested in. This offset right here Offset 36 in hex is equal to offset 54 in decimal. Now, after I say how far into the packet I want Wireshark to look, I can say how many bytes I'm interested in. I want to look for the next four bytes, and the value I'm interested in is 46. That's the hex equivalent of percent sign, capital P, capital D, capital F. And I'll hit enter. And we'll see if it catches that one packet. And there we go. It worked. It cut that one packet. You have to be very careful there because if you're off by one byte, if I said look at offset 55 from the start of the frame, then it's going to start at the 55th byte in and look for 25504444F and it won't find it that way. So that's one of the more complex ways of finding data inside of a packet. Again, if you're looking for data values and data doesn't work or Wireshark doesn't see that there's any data in a trace file, try using the find command to see if you can catch those packets. So far in this section, I've shown you different ways of building display filters using the TCP stream, conversations and endpoints, and even the contents of packets. But what happens if you don't have anything to look at that already has those fields broken out for you? You don't have a packet to look at. You don't even have a conversation or an endpoint that appears to have one of those uh, communications going on. But you need to build a filter on something. For example, maybe you want to build a filter based on some value inside of an HTTP header, but you really don't know the HTTP header field values or contents or structure or anything like that. That's where expressions comes into play. To the right of the filter box, you'll see an expressions button. When you click on the expressions button, Wireshark will show you a list of all of the protocols that it decodes, and a number of these protocols are broken down into their individual fields. So I'm going to type in HTTP, and you can see that down in the bottom, it allows me to type and get directly to the protocol I'm interested in, or the application I'm interested in. I can open up HTTP, and here's what I see. I can see that I have all of these options inside of here. HTTP notification, I can set up a filter that says true. Um, HTTP response, HTTP request, credentials, request method, request URI, response code. So for example, if you don't know how to build one of the HTTP response code filters, like the 404 filter that I built and showed earlier in this section of the course, you could select HTTP response code and then select equal to and you would put in the byte value. 
So here I'll type 404 and I'll say OK. And there's my HTTP response code 404. Now I've just opened up a trace file in the background to test it to see if it works and it, it does. A number of the protocols are broken out even further so you don't even have to know things such as the value that would be on the right hand side of the operand. I'll show you an example to expressions and you take a look at FTP. We'll open up FTP, not FTP data but FTP. Here we can see there are the different field values and we can see some of these true or false. You don't even have to know that uh, a 1 is a true, you know, a 0 is a false. And here are the response codes. If I say FTP response code is equal to, I can just select the one off of here. Can't open data connections. That's what I'm interested in. You've now built a nice little uh, FTP response code equal to 425, and you didn't even have to know that the number 425 was the FTP response code. We can apply it to a trace, see if it works. This trace right here doesn't have anything to do with FTP, so it's not very interesting to test it on that one. It's always a good, good idea to test these uh, filters when you make them. Make sure they work the way that you think they're going to work. Another thing I'd like to show you in the area of expressions is that we don't have to just say that a value is equal to something. We can, let's say we go to HTTP. You'll see that just by selecting HTTP, the default relation up here is, is present. So if we just say OK right now, we'll have made an HTTP filter just using the letters HTTP. In addition, we have the ability of going into, let's say, into an HTTP request area there, and it will tell us which relation works, which operand will work equal to or is not equal to, or it may have more operands that will work. For example, under HTTP request method, we could say the request method is equal to, and we'd put in the character string, is not equal to, is greater than, is less than, is greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to, or it contains a certain data string, or it matches a certain data string. In addition, we can put in here the offset we're interested in and the length. So when we were doing, in the last module, that search for percent sign PDF, we could put in there that we're looking for offset 54 and the length of 4. There's one of the field names that people don't really pay enough attention to, and I, I really I love it. I use it all the time, and that is frame. So I'm just typing in frame. It takes me down to that location. I'll open that up and show you what's available inside of there. There you go. The frame arrival time. This is where, in a previous module, you saw me saying the frame arrival, t arrival time is greater than 90, greater than 90 seconds into the trace. The frame time timestamp, arrival timestamp invalid. The delta from the previous packet. The frame time relative value. The frame number. The packet length or the capture length. And the difference between those two is that the packet length may be one thing, but if you were slicing packets to be shorter, the capture length would be shorter. The point to point direction, link number, file offset, etc. So there are so many things that you can do in this area. When there's a protocol that you see over and over again on the cabling system, and you, you really want to learn to work, work Wireshark as efficiently as possible, go in and check out the filter expressions that are available for that particular protocol or application even. So I'm looking at TCP right now, and there's the syntax for the TCP source port, destination port. This is the syntax I would use if I wanted source or destination port. So I could type in tcp.port uh, equal sign equal sign 80, or maybe I want to use TCP port uh, greater than 80 but less than 110. The next section we'll go through is Boolean operands. Or looking for a specific sequence number, a header length, flags, the window size value. These are also all things that you might think about when you're building your advanced I.O. graphs. I want to give you one warning, though, about working in expressions, and this can be a real hassle. Let's say I want to build uh, a display filter looking for TCP source port. Uh, let's do greater than, looking for 80. that looks pretty good. I'm happy with that. I'll go ahead and apply this. There, we got our traffic. Everything looks great. But now I decide, 
well, wait a minute. I actually, I think I'd like to look for everything uh, that maybe HTTP, and I'm going to go inside of HTTP, and I'm going to look for a specific value. So maybe an HTTP request true. That looks good to me. I'll say OK. Now, unfortunately, because I had a display filter already up in the display filter window, when I opened up expressions, it doesn't automatically clear out your previous filter. So if you're not careful and you're building these very complex filters and you're working very quickly, what you might find sometime is that you've got multiple filters kind of scrunched together there. So make sure that you clear this window out first every time before you go into the expressions area. Wireshark supports several logical operators that will allow you to string together different filters. For example, let me show you how this works. I'm just pulling up a trace file right now. This is the HTTP-ESPN trace file. And in the IP header, perhaps I'm interested in capturing all traffic that is from this source, 24.6.150.44. I'll right mouse click and say that I want to prepare a filter based on the selected value. Now already we can see some of these logical operators showing up. We've got not, and, or, and not, or not. So I'll just select the first filter that I'm interested in. So IP source of 24.6.150.44. Let me go ahead and move some of these columns up so you can see the results when we start applying these filters. There we go. Now, I'm also interested in making sure that all of the traffic that I see is traffic other than UDP traffic. So in this case, I want to add the protocol UDP as a negative to my existing filter. So I'm going to right mouse click, so that I want to prepare a filter. Now, re remember, I'm using prepare a filter so that I can actually watch the filter built up there and it's not automatically just going to apply it in case I want to go in and make changes. So I'll say prepare a filter, and in this case, I, if I say selected or not selected, it's going to wipe out my existing filter up there. If I say and selected, that means that the traffic has got to be from that IP source listed up there above, and it must be UDP traffic, but that's not what I want. If I say or, that means that the traffic has got to match one or the other filter pattern. So it's either got to be IP source of 24.6.150.44, or it's got to be UDP traffic. I don't want that. Now this is what I want. I want to make sure that it is IP source of 24.6.150.44 and it is not UDP traffic. So I'm going to select this and you can see that Wireshark has put in the parentheses around each of my filters and it's put in the logical operand in the middle here. It's the ampersand ampersand for and and exclamation point for not. Now, when you put ampersand, ampersand in the middle, and, it means that when a packet arrives, it's going to be compared to the first filter. Does it match IP source 24.6.150.44? Yes, it does. Okay. It must also match this other filter. Is it also not a UDP packet? Yes, it does. Okay, then it passed. I'll apply this to see what we get out of the filter. And there we go. So we have... All of these packets will be from the source of 24.6.150.44. Uh, they have to be because that's in the filter. And in the protocols column, I shouldn't see anything that says UDP or any UDP style applications, like DNS shouldn't be in there, uh, DHCP shouldn't be in there, etc. What happens if I change this, though, and I say, no, you know, I'm really interested in only UDP traffic from that source. I'll take out the negative operation and click Apply. Now all I have is UDP style traffic from that source. Let me show you what happens if we add onto this filter. So I'm going to change this back to IP source of 24.6.150.44 and not UDP and I'll apply that. Now we only have TCP traffic from that source and I've decided to add another filter in there. 
saying that or DNS. Now, the first thing that's going to happen when you have an or, you've got to really separate both sides. You've got to handle this side first, the left-hand side first, and we do it one filter set at a time. So we look at a packet and we say, does it have this source address? Yes. Is it also not a UDP packet? Yes, we will accept it. Once we've accepted it, then we look on the other side and say, or does it happen to be a DNS packet? And if it's a DNS packet, I will accept it. This is con a contradiction right here in most cases because you're saying you don't want UDP packet on one side, but you're saying on the other side, but I'd love to have some DNS traffic. DNS sits over UDP. So when we apply this, we'll see all of our DNS traffic coming back in. Let me show you a mistake I've seen people make when applying these filters and using the AND and the OR operators. I'm going to open up a trace file called Gen1. It's just some general traffic on a network that's just it's really, really noisy with a lot of DHCP and ARP traffic. But there's some HTTP traffic in there. And I want to get rid of all of the DHCP traffic and I want to get rid of all the ARP traffic. I can do exclamation point ARP. Now some people would think I don't want ARP or DHCP. Now DHCP we have to put in as boot P. So they would read that as I don't want this or that. But that's not the way that the syntax works. We have to say ampersand ampersand because if we had or sitting there that a packet would come in and we'd say, okay, does it match this one? Is it not an ARP packet? Great, we'll accept it, which means that all the, the DHCP traffic would be accepted. And then we'd look on this side and say, well, what about this side now? How about the packets? Does it match that one at all? Oh, ARP traffic matches that one, so ARP traffic would be accepted. If we put in ampersand, ampersand, then it's got to match both sides of this operator in order to be accepted. So I'm going to apply that. Here we go, we got rid of the ARP traffic and the boot P traffic. As I scroll through, I can see that's all missing. So if I don't want the uh, DNS traffic, I'll say and not DNS either. I'll apply that. There we go, now I've gotten rid of the DNS traffic. We can also use this type of filtering uh, when we're working with the time values, the time display filter values. So I'm going to clear this out. I'm going to open up a trace file, and this trace file is one where we have a bad HTTP download. We've got a lot of points in this trace where the time between packets is, is really high. It's really ugly. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change my time display format and say that I want to see the delta value, the second since the previous packet. Now, if you can't remember what the syntax is, you can go up into the frame area, and we can see that the third line down says delta time from the previous packet. I'm going to right mouse click and say I'm going to prepare that as a filter based on the selected value. Now I'm interested in all packets where the delta time value is greater than one and I only want to see the ones where the delta time is less than let's say three seconds. So a packet's got to match both conditions. It's got to have a delta time greater than one and it must have a delta time greater than three. I'll apply this, and we can see that we only have six packets that matched. Now if we change this, let's, let's make sure this works all right. I'll change it to delta time less than five. Sure enough, another packet matched. We now have a packet that has a delta time of four, comparing it to the previous packet before it, packet number 370 in the trace file. We can also use these type of filters when we're looking at packet lengths. Maybe we're interested in packet lengths that are greater than, and I'll apply, uh, prepare this as a filter based on the selected value. A packet length greater than 60. Now the four bytes are stripped off by the network interface card on that particular trace, uh, that system. And that's why we have a packet length of 60 instead of 64. So I'll leave it at 60. Uh, the packet length is greater than 60 and the packet length, I still can't type, PKT underscore LEN, is less than, let's say, 100. So we're looking for itty-bitty stinking packets on the cabling system. 
Remember, the packet's got to match both sides of the operator in order to be viewed. I'll apply this. If everything goes well, I should only see the shorter packets in here. So SIN packets, yeah, those match that. SIN packets are typically little itty-bitty tiny packets. And as I scroll through and I look at the packet length area there in all these packets, I can see you got packet length of 66, 66, 66, 66, 74. So that seems to work. So they're really nice to use, but make sure that you test them. One way you might want to test them is you might want to get a packet generator or maybe work in a lab environment where you know you can spit out the kind of traffic that your filter should accept and then test it out. I have my favorite set of filters, my top 10 filters that I use. And instead of typing them into this filter display box here, I'm going to open up the filter display window and I'm going to create these filters as brand new filters so that this Wireshark system will be ready to go with all of my favorite, favorite filters. Now I'm going to click new 10 times. Actually, I'm going to click 11 times because there is one extra filter that I'm going to give you that I really like. So these are all my new filters and nothing is defined on them yet. The first one is a filter looking for somebody's traffic based on their IP address. There's no source or destination information in there. I just want to find traffic based on someone's address very quickly. So I'm just going to put a placeholder in there of 1.1.1.1. .1 .1 .1. The next filter would be a a MAC filter, basically looking for traffic based on somebody's MAC address. And again, I don't care about source or destination. I just want this MAC address found in either the source or destination MAC address field. So the syntax is eth.addr equal sign equal sign, and I'll put in my placeholders here so it will at least go green. There we go. You got to remember on those MAC address filters, by the way, that the bytes are separated by uh, colons, not by dashes. Now the next one is my ICMP filter. I love ICMP. Live it, eat it, breathe it, absolutely love it. I can learn so much about a network based on ICMP traffic. Remember that you can't use capital letters in those filter string, the beginning of the filter string. You can do that in a hex area, but you can't do it inside the filter string. So here we go. Now the next filter that I like is one that is called my Mac, and you saw me build that earlier in this training section. So eth.addr equal sign equal sign and now I've got to put in my MAC address. And my MAC address is 00 colon 16 colon 36 colon a oops a9 colon 08 colon 20. And as I mentioned before, now this is one of those areas where you can use capital letter, it doesn't matter. It's just hex. Now this is why I like to build a filter for my own traffic. If I'm testing an application or I'm having any problems at all, I want to catch my own traffic. In the case of testing an application, I'll bring an application on a lab machine, bring up Wireshark, start filtering on my own traffic, and then run that application. And now I can go back and look at the trace and learn how that application starts up, how it communicates across the wire, what its dependencies are, what type of typical uh, round trip times I'm getting when I communicate, and that's those kinds of things. Also, if I'm out traveling and I'm on the road and I'm at hotel networks, and typically hotel networks are terrible networks, typically what I will do is I'll connect in and find out that the performance is awful. So I want to find out why. Now I am the victim. Now I'm the end user that's having the problems. So I'll capture my own traffic. Now I can relate to a user that says, you know, I went to this page and it just didn't load. You know, it was terrible. Well, I've got a trace that shows me what that looks like on the cabling system, and I have the experience that tells me what that feels like when you go through it. Now, the next filter that I'll build is based on this filter, based on the My Mac filter. So I'll just click New here. There's the, the one that I've created. Now, this one is called a Not My Mac filter. And the only thing I'm going to change in this filter is I'll put the exclamation point in front of it. Now, it will capture all traffic except traffic to or from my hardware address. And I use this when I go to customer sites, and maybe I'm capturing traffic off of the network, but I might want to go web browsing and start doing some research. I don't want my traffic to be caught in the trace file, so I'll by default place the not my Mac filter on my system as I start working at a client site. 
Now I'm going to get rid of one of these because I put in an extra one earlier. The next one is a filter that really should be built into Wireshark, but it's not. And it's the DHCP filter. And we do not type DHCP to create a DHCP filter. We type boot P because it's a derivative of boot P. The next filter I like to do deals with time. I like to see the delta time between packets. So I'll type in frame delta underscore time. And I usually don't look for a specific delta time. I look for a delta time greater than some value. Now remember, if you see this area, the filter string area, and it's in red, something is wrong. And certainly this is not the syntax for delta time. The delta time should be frame dot time underscore delta. There we go. It's greater than 1. The next one that I like is a filter that looks for traffic to and from a specific TCP port, but it's bidirectional, which means I'm not putting in TCP source port or TCP destination port. I'm just saying I'm looking for traffic to or from this port, whatever it is. And I'll put in a, a placeholder in there. I'll put zero as a placeholder because I can always replace that. The next one is the same kind of thing, but it's for UDP traffic. So it's just simply UDP.port equal sign equal sign, and there's my placeholder in there, so it turns green. Now I also like to add the TCP analysis uh, filter to calculate the round trip times, the acknowledgement round trip times. So the title of this will be TCP ACK RTT. And I'll type in tcp.analysis.ac underscore RTT. Now, at this point, I would probably do a greater than, and I'm going to put a placeholder in there. Again, that would want, be one that would allow me to measure where I have really large gaps in time in the trace file. And the last one is one that tells me how much data is actually crossing the wire. Without any headers, I'm just simply looking at the data. And most of the time, file transfer occurs over TCP, not UDP. So this is going to be TCP length. And there we go. Now, I can say that I'm looking for TCP length above a certain value. I could even combine it and say tcp.len less than. 100, oops, I have to put in my operand, TCP LEN less than 100, something like that. And let me change 1 to 100. Let's do it greater than 1, but less than 100. That looks a little bit better. And there you go. So these are some of my very favorite uh, display filters that I use all the time. And I'm sure you'll come up with additional ones that you like. Most likely, and I hope you're not going to sit on your Wireshark system and type all those in as I just did and then have to go to a new machine and type them in again and again and again and again. Remember that once you create these display filters and you apply them and you say OK, they're going to be saved with your display filter set. In the next section, I just briefly want to take you into there and show you how you can copy display filters from your display filter set to someone else's without replacing all of their filters. The last thing in this section that I want to show you is how you can manually edit the display filters file. And this is also the way that if you want to share just certain uh, display filters with someone else, you can quickly and easily give them the display filters you want. So I'm in the Documents and Settings directory, WSU Developer, Application Data, Wireshark. Now, I log in as WSU Developer, so this is where my display filters file is kept. I'll double click on that display filters file. And I'm going to open it up. Notepad's going to be too ugly, so I'm going to open it up with WordPad. Here we go. We can see that every filter is on its own line. And down at the bottom, you'll also notice that there's an empty line. You've got to always make sure that you do a carriage return line feed after the last line. So you have one empty line at the bottom. Otherwise, your last filter is going to be missing. Now, these are all of the filters that are my favorite filters. This last set here, starting with IP.ADDR going down to my not Mac filter, not my Mac filter, excuse me.
Now these are the filters that I want to share with somebody else. So I'm just going to copy them into my buffer. Go ahead and close that. And then I'm going to open up someone else's dfilters file. Or I'll create a dfilters-from-me file or something like that. This is Fred's display filters file. I'll open that up. Again, I'm going to open this with WordPad. Now I'm in here, I'm on the last blank line, and I'm going to paste in my filters. No matter what, I always have to make sure I have one blank line at the end, because if, it's, if the file is like this, it's going to clip off and you're not going to see, your, he's not going to see your not my Mac filter. So always remember to hit, you know, enter at the last line. This is also an easy, easy way to make additional filters. So you could say, oh, I want to make some TCP port filters. I'm going to put in a bunch of these, and we'll say TCP port 21, this one will be TCP port 110, this will be TCP port 25, SMTP filters, this is TCP port 6881, this is TCP port uh, 6346, that's actually Nutella, that's why I was being specific there. And, of course, yes, we could just type FTP, but I'm just showing you here what it would take to build these. All you have to do is go and just manually edit them, and when you bring up Wireshark, and this is the filter set you're using, you'll see all, the, all those filters in it. Again, I did check to make sure I had a carriage return line feed at the end of that. I'll go ahead and close that window down, say that I want to save them. Yes. I'm just quickly going to try to do the same thing and test it for you, and I'm opening my filter set. I have Wireshark running in the background. So I'm going to go at the very top of this whole entire filter set, and I'm going to copy this Ethernet address filter set. I'm going to paste another one on top of there, and I just want to show you that it shows up. So 9999999. Oops. 9. There we go. I can't possibly type that twice, so I'm going to have to cut and paste this into the de description area. There we go. Once again, I'll check. Bottom of the filter has a blank line. Great. File. Save. Now I'm going to toggle over to Wireshark. Now, as I mentioned before, I had Wireshark running in the background, and I restarted Wireshark so it could bring up the new display filters file. That's the downside of manually editing the display filters file. Now when I click display filters, there it is. There's my Ethernet address of 999999999, which is garbage, and I'm going to want to delete that. So it's pretty easy to share filters. You can just do it you know, simply through you know, WordPad. Just manually go in, type them in, cut and paste them, whatever you want to do to share them quickly.